How's everybody doing? You having a good Agile tour so far? Yeah? I, I was not expecting so many people. I'm a little bit scared, I'll be honest with you. Please be nice. What was that? I got it? Fingers crossed. I'm happy to be here today. I'll be talking about abandoning delegation, servant leadership, that kinds of stuff. My name is Daniel Tardif. I'm a practice coach with Tech Systems, which is a consulting firm that work, works out of uh, Montreal here, also has an office in Dallas. Um, and as a practice coach, I do a lot of internal coaching with our teams. I also help when they're working with customers, and I, I see a lot of things, patterns, kind of things that occur when, when you see people trying to be servant leaders in the world of today, uh, which is something I think is nonetheless important when you think of what is needed or required when you're trying to work in an agile way. And so I've got a little bit of a, a deck here prepared for us. I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I've seen, I've learned, I've found uh, to share with you. Um, I will ask that, you know, take the time to listen. If you get a chance at the end of the presentation, you open up the app for the event and guidebook. Uh, if you want to share some constructive criticism or evaluate the, the, the session, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm also looking to kind of, you know, better myself and whatnot. Um, but with that said, let's get started. All right. All right, we're going to start with a saw. We're going to start violent. Um, I actually want to tell a story with this because this is a picture, uh, not of me and my father, but it represents my kind of growing up. When I was a kid, my father fancied himself a handyman. I'm not saying that he wasn't. I know this video is recorded. Dad, I'm not saying you're not a handyman. Uh, <laughs> but he did renovate the house, renovate the basement, renovate the kitchen, renovate the basement again. And he needed a helper whenever he was doing this stuff. Now, I was a kid at the time. I can't be walking around with saws and you know, uh, nail guns and those kinds of things, it's a little bit dangerous. So he was doing all the, the, the dangerous work and I would kind of just, you know, he'd say, can you go get the saw? And I'd kind of walk over, grab the saw, bring it to him. Can you go get the, the nails? I'd walk over and get it to him and that kinds of stuff. Over time, I, I kind of built this bond or this understanding of what it is that he would need um, without him needing to ask for it. At some point, it's like we became almost telepathic. I kind of understood that he was going to do this thing next. He was going to do something that needed a saw, and I would just go and grab the saw and bring it to him. And so that, that kind of bond, that kind of situation that happened, effectively allowed me to be a good, we're going to be talking about servant leaderships today, so a good servant in this situation. Now, I say a good servant, and I leave it at that. I'd be curious to know from the group here, based on what you know, does this make me a servant leader in this situation? Just curious show of hands, who would think yes? You got one person, two, three, four. Okay, not bad, not bad. I was expecting more hands to show up. I'm curious to know why people think no, although I'll, I'll have to agree with most people that kept their hand down. Um, if I'm a five-year-old kid, am I being a leader or am I just being a servant? And servant not in the negative way, not a negative connotation, but rather am I just facilitating the person who's doing the work to get them to succeed? In this case, he being the father of the parent, nonetheless is the leader of what is happening, um, and I'm working at his behest. But that kind of, I think, puts you nonetheless in a good mindset. If you've lived these kinds of experiences in your life, if you've worked with people, mentors, uh, coaches, and, and you get to the point where you're kind of understanding and you're, you're able to serve them without them having to ask you what it is that you need, then you've kind of understood a very fundamental piece of what it is to be a servant leader. Um, and so some of you might be thinking, you know, in your past of situations that you've lived, and you're like, I remember that. And that gives you the one half that you kind of need to be able to become a servant leader. Not saying that if you don't go through this, you're not going to become a servant leader. It might be just a little bit more difficult. So let's take a step back. We kind of all have an idea of what a servant is with this story. I want to talk about a little bit what a leader is. So there are a bunch of different definitions out there. There are a bunch of people that are going to be more than happy to sell you a book about what a leader is. I mean, it's, it's quite impressive, to be honest with you. I like this. It's fairly straightforward, simple. Leadership has nothing to do with seniority, right? Think of where you're working today. Think of your organizations either as friends or as colleagues. I bet you there are people that have been part of those organizations lo less long than the people that have been there the most who are maybe more leaders than others. So even though we'd like to think that maybe a leadership is tied to seniority, it isn't really. Same thing with regards to titles. 
Right? We're brought up to believe that because I got the fancy title, that means I'm a leader. That means you know, I'm, 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 I'm up there. That's awesome. Not necessarily. You can find leaders throughout organizations. You can find leaders at the very top, the very bottom, the very middle. And so it's not necessarily a title thing. And, and also, I don't think leadership is management. You can have very good leaders in management. You can have people that know what they're doing, that are mentoring you, that are helping you grow and all that kinds of stuff. But as a manager, that doesn't automatically make you a leader. So I like this definition of leadership from uh, Kevin Cruz. Cruz? Uh, leadership is a process of social influence which maximizes the effort of others towards the achievement of a goal. There's a lot of stuff in this one sentence. There's a lot of information. It's a bit uncomfortable, I would say, because you're talking about influencing people. Synonym of influencing, you're talking about manipulating people into being the best that they can be. But nonetheless, there's that little element of manip manipulation there. I like it, though, because it's essentially leadership is a process to get things done through people. Therefore, leaders are people that use this process to get things done through people. Cool. What's the process? Well, it depends. You can have authoritarian leaders. You can have servant leaders. The process is kind of where we can play a little bit of a game and you know, move things around a little bit. Let's look at servant leadership. Servant leadership, I'm sure, has existed far before the 1700s. Uh, but one of the first mentions of servant leadership was in the 1700s. Some king of Prussia dude said, hey, I want to be the servant of the state. Good for you, you know, thinking ahead. It's awesome. Servant leadership, though, was popularized in the 1970s by this dude who's, I forget his name, Mr. Greenleaf. And still to this day, there's an organization, Society for Servant Leadership, the Greenleaf Society for Servant Leadership, that exists to promote servant leadership within the world. You can look them up if you're interested. They have an interesting definition of what it means to be a servant leader. A servant leader is a servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. I don't know about you, but I hate this definition. It means not much. I mean, it means what it means to be a servant. I want to serve first, that's what I want to do. I'm here to serve you. Doesn't mean much, I feel, from a leadership perspective though. Feels like there's something missing. I'm not good at math, but we can add these two things together. Right? And the answer is 42. <laughs> I'm so happy people laughed at that. So if you add the two definitions together, remember the first one talks about a process of social influence. The second one talks about a certain way of being when it is that you're a servant. If you mix the servant leader and you replace the process with it, you end up with a situation where the servant leader uses serving others as a form of social influence. And here I think this is a good definition of servant leadership. It's, it's a situation where the process that you use as a leader to be a leader is serving others. You essentially allow people to become the best that they can through serving them. So I like this. This is my opinion. I think it's a good definition. It doesn't necessarily jive, though, with what we have in the world today. You look at movies, you look at books, you look at TV shows. The servant leaders are not necessarily this. They're the, they're the heroes. The Tom Cruise, the, I don't know, uh, Tony Stark, those kinds of people. They're the one person. They're the leaders. They're the heroes. And even when you look at this picture here, who's the leader in this picture? Automatically? Most of you are probably thinking the dude at the front, right? Just because it's how we're wired. That's how we grew up. That's what we see. That's what we do. Maybe the leader is somebody in this gaggle here at the back, but I don't know. It's nowhere more clear than if you look at uh, social media. Who here has seen this post about the, 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 what are these? These are wolves. Thank you. I was thinking lions for some reason. The wolves. If you haven't seen this, it's a really interesting post. It speaks to how wolves walk in a pack. They put the most uh, feeble, the most uh, uh, fragile members of their pack at the beginning of the line, and then they surround them by the next five who are the strongest, who are going to protect them, and then you got the rest of the pack, and then at the very end, you got the leader. You know, and they're all serving each other. The problem is it's completely false. This is a picture, it's a true picture, it is a pack of wolves that was taken from, uh, for a BBC 
uh, show about nature of some sort. Uh, but the ones at the front are the alphas. They're probably the parents of the ones that are following. The one in the back might be a little bit old. But nonetheless, this thing, there are a few people that put their hands up, this thing has been doing the rounds and it's still making the rounds today in social media because it kind of attacks our fundamental understanding of what it means to be a leader. We're like, wow, maybe servant leadership is normal. I got to share this, share, retweet, all that kinds of stuff. So I hope to kind of break this paradigm today. We'll see if it works. Let's do a little bit of a thought exercise. I want everybody to take a moment, close your eyes, take a deep breath. A few people close their eyes. Cool. Think of a leader. Anybody, it could be yourself, could be a boss, could be a coworker, could be a political figure, a leader of some sort. And now I'm going to ask you two questions. First one is going to be, are they a good or a bad leader? Hmm. What does that mean? Let's think about that a little bit, right? Okay, are they a good or a bad leader? Do they have good or bad qualities of being a leader? Well, here's the next question. Does the answer to the first question make them a good or a bad person? Is being a good leader meaning that you're a good person? If you're a bad leader, does that mean that you're a bad person? A bad leader is not necessarily a bad person, but it kind of feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? You're working with people, and this guy just said something, your boss said something, you're like, ah, oh, what's, what's this guy's problem? He's an idiot. Doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and some of you in this room are wanting to be leaders, right? But when you look at what different times, types of bosses or leaders exist out there, this is one of an incredible number of articles that exist out there of words that are used to define different types of leaders. There's one word here that's positive. Maybe two. It's great. Everything else has got a negative connotation to it. So that puts you in a position, you as people that want to be leaders, as leaders yourselves, if you fail at being a leader, which means if you're a bad leader, does that mean that you're a bad person? Don't worry. The answer is no. You're not a bad person. You're human. It's normal to make mistakes. But what you're doing is you're falling into the first sin of servant leadership, shame. It's totally normal for us as humans to feel shame. Some of you might know, and if you don't, I definitely encourage you to watch the videos and read the books of Brene Brown. Very, very interesting books and videos about how people deal with shame. And as a servant leader, if you feel shame, you will behave differently. You will behave in ways that are not constructive for the team. You will make decisions for the team. You won't be able to defend them as well. You'll be ashamed of what it is that they're doing, that you're doing. You won't be able to stand up to them. This feels bad. This feels wrong. I'm not shameful. I'm a leader. But I think it's important to recognize that this is definitely something that we can fall into. I myself can fall into as well. So maybe you're thinking, you know what? You're right. I'm a little bit shameful, but I'm going to change that. I'm thinking, that's great. You change it. I'm going to be the best leader, servant leader, this team has ever wanted. I'm going to get them croissants every morning. <laughs> They're going to have breakfast warm, you know, with coffee. They're going to love me so much. Every end of sprint, I'm going to get them a trophy. You know, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a medal. Everybody gets a little certificate. Well done. Maybe sometimes the team's going to fail, but I'm going to be so good, such a good servant leader for them. Even though they fail, I'm, I'm just going to change that. I don't know if you saw the animation. I'm just going to change that. Goes from an F to an A. You could do that, but then you're kind of falling into the second sin of servant leadership. Smother. It's a wonderful word. You're smothering the team. You're smothering the team. You're taking all the hits. You're essentially making it so that they don't feel any concern or danger anymore. Any commitments don't mean anything to them because they know that you've got their back and they cannot fail. There's this really good um, term, uh, being a scrum mom or a scrum pop, like a scrum parent, if you will. This type of person might hide negative feedback, 
pamper the teams, uh, prevent team failure as much as possible, not challenging the team. And some of you might recognize yourselves in this. I want to take a moment to go back to one of the first slides that we saw, though. That's okay, because we're just human. Being a bad leader doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means you've got room to grow. So it's okay. But nonetheless, this is something you want to be aware of, right? You don't want to smother the team. You don't want to be a scrum mom or a scrum pop. You can search for these terms. You'll find some really interesting articles about this stuff. Um, I, I borrowed this as well from Herding Cats. If you've not seen uh, the, the blog Herding Cats, definitely something that's very interesting that you can read. Um, this is uh, somebody who's taking servant leadership, actually specifically scrum mastering, and is saying, how can we make scrum mastering, how can we parallel it to parenting? So you've got helicopter parents, or helicopter servant people, drill sergeant parents, or drill sergeant servant leaders, right? These are helicopters, somebody who's always going to be there to rescue the team. Don't worry, I got your back. I'm there for you. Drill sergeant, somebody who's only kind of interested in the process. Did you do your stand-up today? No, you should do your stand-up today. Why didn't you do your stand-up today? You should do your stand-up today, right? What you should strive to be is more of a consulting servant leader, somebody who's going to be there for the team, who's going to advise, who's going to help, but not necessarily doing the work for them, not necessarily hiding things when things are tough, when times are tough, but kind of being there for them. And you might be thinking, oh my goodness, there's so many things to remember. I'm not gonna remember all of this. There is a lot of stuff to remember. What's important is that you just take it one day at a time. Again, just because you're growing as a, as a leader doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It means that you're just getting better. I don't know if you've realized yet, I'm going to hammer this home. <laughs> Servant leadership is important. It's not easy, but it's key for us to succeed. And we know this because it's everywhere. I'm going to pull up the manifesto and the scrum, scrum guide here for a moment. It's in there as well. And the scrum guide, they speak to, uh, on the right side here, they speak to, you need teams to be able to comp accomplish their work rather than having things being directed to them. The, the manifesto, one of the principles, speaks to, oh, I'm sorry, speaks to, uh, trusting the team to get stuff done. So it, it's, it's important. It's there. It's in the world of Agile, and yet it's so difficult. So now you might be thinking, okay, I agree with you, Daniel. It is important. I will be the best servant leader I can ever be. I will leave the team alone. I'll let them do their thing. And they'll never see me again. <laughs> thinking that's probably a bad thing. I'm thinking that's probably a sin. Abandonment, the third sin. You don't want to abandon the team, and I think this is the one, even though it's number three, because it makes for a good story in the presentation, this is the one that I think I see the most often. People are thinking, you know what? I got the team to where they need to be. I'm good. They're good. Good luck. It's not how it works, unfortunately. The, the, the teams will kind of always need your help. They'll always need a presence. They'll always need somebody to be there to help them out. They'll always need a servant leader. Maybe they don't need you as much as they did, but things will arrive from the side. Things will arrive from up high, down low. They'll have conflicts between them. A really good tool to navigate as a servant leader in, in, in this kind of a situation is the circles of influence. Hopefully, I don't know if you've seen this before. I love this tool. This is kind of a tool that I use. Um, some, of these ver some of the versions of this have two circles. I like the one with three. Uh, where you've got a circle of control, which is the middle circle, circle of influence, which is the other middle circle, uh, and then circle of concern, which is the outer circle. Your team should really focus on what it is that they can control. So when you're doing retrospectives with them, when, when they're dealing with problems and that they're trying to solve, they should be trying to solve the problems that they can control, that, that are within their realm of control. They might also be able to influence challenges that are outside of their control, but to the betterment of the team and its performance. But they can't do much about circles of concern. These are things that are going to happen outside of their scope of influence. There's not much that they can do. But you, as a servant leader, where do you live in all of this? Well, maybe you're one step removed. You know, what's in the circle of control? That's the teams. Let the team deal with it, maybe coach them a little bit, help them out, maybe they need some advice, but let them find the solution to their own problems. Circle of influence, maybe you can help with the influence as well. Circle of concern, where they can't do anything, this is maybe where you shine. Maybe your circle of control is there. 
Now, you will also have circles of influence and circles of concern yourself, so there's only a certain point at which you can help, but nonetheless, this kind of helps you figure out where it is that you should leave the team alone. Not alone. Don't abandon them, right? But let them solve their own problems and where the team might need your help. So in essence, you might be thinking, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I'm going to be what the team needs me to be. I'm going to be a superhero. I'm going to be Superman. And sorry. <laughs> I'm moving this way. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and in a way, maybe. But in a way, this is also maybe a little bit dangerous. I'm Superman. I'm going to help the team uh, overcome all of their challenges, all of their problems. You, over time, might find yourself moving back into the team's circle of control and becoming the middle person, the person they all go to, the person they go to to solve the problems. And then it, suddenly it becomes about you. And, and I've lived this. I, I am culpable of this last, last sin, sorry, the ego, uh, because I have lived it where you are working with a team and things are going so well and you're so gelled and everybody's coming to you and you've got all the answers and all that kinds of stuff. But what does that do if you go on vacation? Or you win the lottery? I like that one better. What happens if you win the lottery? The team is going to be lost because you've made yourself the center of the team. And so the last sin that I'm going to share with you today is the ego. So here you go. Could put them all together. Shame, smother, abandonment, ego. Some tricks and tips on how it is that you can tackle each of them. You might be, you know, thinking, hey, I've got other sins that I can think of. Great. Let's say share them. Let's hear about them. You know, post them, write articles about them. This is how we grow. And again, I, I think this is very important. When you're talking about this stuff and you're trying to become a servant leader yourself, that you look at this and you be humble about it. You recognize and accept that you can be shameful. You can be smothering. You can have an ego. You can abandon people. And you can better yourself. That's, that's what's important here. Because if you're not even able to accept that you're going to do these things, how can you better yourself? So we got all these words again. And I guess what I'm saying is that a bad leader is not necessarily a bad person. But a good leader is not necessarily perfect either. And, and that's true of servant leadership. You're going to make mistakes, and there are going to be people that are going to call you names. They're going to say bad things about you. And that's okay. It hurts. It sucks. You take it on the chin. You move on to the next. I'm thinking that you're here today because you kind of wanted to uh, learn about servant leadership, or maybe how it is that you could be a better servant leader um, hopefully the ego, uh, the ego, the four sins have helped with that. I'd like to spend the next minutes here going through different, uh, how do you say, different um, patterns and anti-patterns that I've seen and speak to them in my experiences. And hopefully this will help you kind of see how it is that you yourself have maybe acted in this way and, and how you might be able to act a little bit differently. I want to start with the anti-patterns because those are the most fun. It's always fun to see what it is that you shouldn't be doing. Solving problems for others. We've seen this and we talked about this a little bit. If you find yourself having people always coming to you with problems and you're always giving them the answer, then this is maybe something that you should try to push away from. Try to wean people off of it. If you just do it very kind of rip the band-aid off, it might hurt the team itself. But one of the really neat tools that you can use for this is just ask, what would you do? Just throw it back onto them. All right. If you're able to ask that question, what would you do? It kind of puts people in a bit of a weird situation. They're like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Because they're used to you answering the questions. As time goes on, maybe you can ask people to, rather than coming to you with problems and asking them what they would do, you ask them to come to you with solutions. They come to you and say, hey, I'm going to do this. Oh, okay, why? Oh, because we're running into this problem and this is what I think is the best to solve it. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Excellent. And that's how you can kind of step out of that anti-pattern. Avoiding conflicts, questions, 
challenges, this is where the team needs you as a servant leader because if you've got people on the team that are not working well together and you abandon them and expect them to solve their own problems, that might be a little bit difficult for them and it might fester and it might hurt. What you can do for this is, well, number one, don't avoid them. Recognize that there are conflicts. You gotta kinda decide whether or not you're gonna get involved because some conflicts do resolve themselves but others might be a little bit more difficult. One of the frameworks I like to use, and I wish I had created a slide for this, but I unfortunately do not, um, is a framework about interests, um, rights, and power. Those three words, interests, rights, and power. And so when you're trying to manage a conflict, what you want to do is you want to bring everybody back down to interests. What is in our best interest to solve this problem? You can kind of look at rights and power as, uh, you know, you've got a teenager at home, and the teenager says, you're not being fair. It's my right to, I don't know, lock the door of my room. And then you're going to say, I'm the parent. I have the power. And as long as you live under my roof, you're going to do as I say. So you're kind of moving up that scale. And what happens then is essentially you're escalating the situation and making it worse. If you want to try and come down the scale instead, what is in our best interest? Let's have a conversation about that. Don't make it about you're stepping on my rights or you don't have the power to do these kinds of things. Then you could be more... Uh, efficient in, in solving conflicts. Assigning tasks to teams. I almost feel like this one doesn't deserve more than that. <laughs> I'm hoping everybody knows that you shouldn't assign tasks to teams. It happens. I know it happens. Whenever I see it, I cringe. But it does happen. So the question is, how do you wean yourself off of this? A team might not know how to pick up tasks, right? They should be pulling the tasks. It should be saying, we're going to do these things. They might be new. They might be junior. They might not know. You can, rather than telling them what to do, you can show them how they can pick what it is that they should do first. Oh, what's the highest priority? Are there any dependencies? What do you think that you should do first? Throw it back onto them rather than you making decisions for them. And this might be tough for somebody who has been on a team who used to be a senior developer or an intermediate developer, and they're used to doing the work, and they're used to working in this environment where they would know kind of where the tasks are. This can also be a challenge for somebody who was working with a previous team that had a way of working, and now they're moving on to a new team, and they kind of want to keep on doing the thing that they used to do. And so you got to catch yourself. If you're in these situations, kind of take a step back, recognize, okay, no, this is not my responsibility anymore as a servant leader to tell these people what to do. Let's empower them so that they can pick their own things. The daily stand-up being a status update. Pop quiz. Who knows what the true purpose of the daily stand-up is? Does anybody know? Per the scrum guide. Yes? To find out if you're in a good space to achieve the goal of the sprint? Maybe. Does anybody have a different answer? So I'm hearing to facilitate openness and communication within the team, maybe. Identify impediments. Identify impediments, maybe. You, I, I don't have a prize. <laughs> the gentleman said, synchronize yourself for the next 24 hours. Almost word for word, that is what is in the Scrum Guide. It's not about status. It's not about the three questions. Those three freaking questions. <laughs> They're useful and they're in the scrum guide, but it's an example. But what it does is it makes people just go through the motion and they forget the purpose of that meeting, which is for the team to coordinate for the next 24 hours. Everything else you guys said is, is correct as well. It kind of happens as that is happening. But if you're just doing the three questions, your stand-up is going to become a status update. Not only that, but if you're a servant leader and you're on the team and the team is not nor used to having you as a servant leader on the team, listening to those things, they might feel pressured to give you a status update because they don't want to look like they're not doing anything. So your presence might cause this. And I'm not telling you not to attend stand-ups. Rather, what I'm saying is coach them. Help them see that what they're doing is not useful to them. It's just telling you what they've done over the past 24 hours. Congratulations, you did your job. Bravo. I mean, that's what I'm paying you for, you know? So that's, that's how you can get out of this. Is be aware that this might happen because of those three questions or just because you're present in this meeting. 
Meetings don't respect time boxes. This is basic facilitation stuff. Um, if, if there might be other issues happening as well if you're not able to close things within your time boxes. Uh, there's a lot of really good information on the internet about facilitation. You can look to the International Facilitation um, Association as well. They can help you with that kinds of stuff. Um, but definitely that's somewhere, something that you need to look at as well. And team performance is evaluated on velocity or points. This one, interestingly enough, I know it happens, it frustrates me. Um, because points is just a measure of work or effort and again, I mean you're doing your job. I expect you to be able to you know, do work and do points. What I really care about is you're getting some value out there. Um, but I see this more and more and it's a little bit scary to me. I, I see it as a, a symptom of the first sin, which right now I'm drawing a blank. Does anybody remember what the first sin was? Shame. Shame. I see it in that way because, um, you guys are listening, this is pretty awesome, by the way. <laughs> I, I see it because as a servant leader, and, and I'm not saying that if you're a servant leader and you guys are measuring performance by velocity that this is what's happening to you and therefore you're a bad person, but as a servant leader, you should fight tooth and nail against this kinds of stuff. And you should feel confident that your team is going to deliver value. And it's not about points, it's about the value that they deliver. It's about the, the business value that they bring. And so I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, as a servant leader, have the fight. Push back on this stuff. Right? Some people will be a little bit afraid, concerned, not have the ammunition or, or you know, the power to speak up and shield their team and protect their team. And if this conversation happens, kind of build your ammunition up so you can have the conversation about why you don't want to use points for your team's performance. A few more that I enjoy. This is uh, grabbed from a different source um, that speaks about coaching and whatnot. Um, swooping in at a stand-up. So you're not at a present, but you're joining maybe th every three or four stand-ups. And when you join the stand-up, you hop on the phone because it's on the phone, and you just talk for the 15 minutes, and then you hang up. I mean, that's a horrible thing to do. Oh, my goodness. The, the team themselves are going to be very disturbed by this kinds of stuff, and this is something you definitely want to avoid. You yourself might be thinking, hey, I'm helping out, you know, I'm, I'm bringing the ideas, I've got these ideas, this is how you should organize yourselves. That's the ego talking. The stand-up is for them. As the gentleman said, the stand-up is for the team to organize the next 24 hours. It's not for you to pontificate on what you think is the next best thing for them to do. Listening just enough for the next retrospective or the next meeting or whatever, and then leaving. So you're like, Okay, okay, they said they're good. Okay, I'm leaving. Or, oh, okay, it looks like they're having a fight. Okay, I'm going to go away, and we're going to talk about it later at the retrospective. You've got to be careful about that stuff as well. As a servant leader, you should expect that you need to be present. This is kind of abandonment if you're not present for the team. And so take the time to be there. Being the middle person for everybody, being the router, Everybody that wants to see the team, come see you. This can happen kind of naturally if you're a servant leader and you're a good servant leader and you're shielding the team. If people want to go see the team, they might naturally start going to see you. Okay, that's good. That means you're shielding the team, but it might become ingrained and more and more people might come and see you. And then people within the team might start to come see you before they go see their colleagues. And so you should be aware of that as well. Be careful of that. If the team, if somebody comes to see you and says, hey, uh, have you spoken to so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so is on the team, you should throw that back and say, have you spoken to this person yourself? Oh, no. Maybe we should set something up. Maybe you guys should have a conversation. Maybe you guys should have a chat. And finally, being the expert, which I think I talked about a little bit as well, the person who's the know-it-all. Um, not mean again, but just somebody who in the past has been the expert technically, who's kind of stepping up because they've received the promotion or they've received new responsibilities, but they're having difficulty letting those old ones go because they're afraid the team is going to fail. OK. I've been talking a little fast. I think we're going to finish a little bit early here, which is great, because you guys will get to kind of stand up and walk around a little bit. Uh, but I do want to speak a little bit to some positive patterns as well. And so I think we'll wrap it up with this here. As a servant leader, there are some things that you can do that are positive that will impact the team. Number one is walking the talk. And that means behaving genuinely, being the person that you want them to be. And it's not going to the person and saying, hey, look, you see how I did that? I was a good servant leader. No, don't do that. That's, you're being a butt. Don't do that. Right? But it's essentially behaving in the way that you want them to behave, behaving in the way that you want to see people 
behave. As a leader, people will naturally tend to reflect what it is that they see of you. You can also genuinely ask why. Now, why is a very powerful word. It's a very dangerous word because it can send people off on tangents. It can send people down on spirals. But sometimes, used correctly, it can be a very, very powerful word when the team is trying to solve their own problems and maybe the problem or the answer to that problem is staring them in the face. You can question them, asking why, or different ways of asking why, to try and get them to what you think might be a good solution for them. So without giving them the answer up front, helping them kind of solve that problem by getting them to think a little bit more about it. You want to make sure all voices are heard. You might see that you're doing this, uh, everybody's in a big meeting, everybody's talking, somebody keeps on trying to talk, but they keep on being interrupted. And it's not mean, nobody's trying to like shut them out, or shut them down, but they're just, they've got a quiet voice, or they've got a little bit of a, you know, a small demeanor like that. Well then in that case, you can kind of speak up as a leader, People will kind of stop talking when you're talking, and you can say, oh, sorry, Stephanie, you wanted to add something? I use Stephanie. I don't know if there's a Stephanie in this room, but it's part of the example. And finally, and I think the most important, and hopefully you understand that the, te the theme for today was this, and I hope that you walk away with this, is doing little retrospectives internally for yourself, growing yourself, accepting that you're not going to be perfect. In fact, perfect is... is very difficult to achieve. But as long as you're trying to improve over and over again, as long as you're moving to that needle just a little bit, then whatever the names that people might call you because you're being a bad leader, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. And it means that you're trying your best to get to where it is that you want to be. So I encourage you, if you're ever finishing a meeting, finishing a conversation, me after this presentation, I'm going to be doing this as well, getting off a phone call, take two, three, ten seconds. How did that go? What could I have done differently? What did I do well that I want to do again? These are kind of questions that you can ask yourself. And with that, I am pretty much done. So, I will, I will apologize, I spoke a little bit faster, so we're finishing a little early. If you have any questions, I'm available. Otherwise, I wish you all good luck in your personal journeys. I'm hoping that you all be excellent servant leaders. Thank you.